Dr. Cohn, thank you for welcoming me to the Center for Device Innovation at Texas Medical Center. It's a privilege to be here today. Well, thanks for coming. We're really proud of the facility, and it's good to see you all. Thank you. So let's get started. I want to talk about you. Okay. So I'm going to take it all the way back. What did you want to be when you were just a little boy? Okay, so, uh, and that's uh, a key part of the story. Excellent. Because I grew up in Houston, Texas. And when I grew up, Houston, Texas was the epicenter of heart surgery. It was heart surgery, it was a space program. And my mom and dad were great parents and really encouraged their kids. But one of the things my mom did was really sort of uh, elevated the heart surgeons in Houston to superhero status. And it was easy to do because the front pages of the newspapers all frequently had, you know, uh, uh, you know, trumpeted their accomplishments because a lot of the first came from Houston. Did you know that Houston has the largest medical center on the planet? Absolutely. Okay. Well, in the early days, even in the 1960s, that was emerging and it was the epicenter of heart surgery. Uh, the first successful transplant was done here, the first bypasses, the first replacement of big blood vessels. These guys were titans. And uh, so my mom would cut out the newspaper articles and put them by my cereal bowl when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, going off to school. And when I was nine, it was really kind of cool, uh, Denton Cooley put in the world's first artificial heart. That newspaper article got clipped out and was sitting next to my cereal bowl. And I, you know, trying to be a good boy, I would read, read the articles. And I actually took that one to school with me. And I wasn't the best student. And I had the article and I was showing somebody in class when I was supposed to be doing something else. And the teacher saw the disruption, walked over and said, what do you have? And she looked at it and said, oh, what is this? And I told her and she had me get up in front of the classroom and tell them about what this was. And at that point I said, yeah, I'm in, this is what I'm gonna do. Wow, so you had a, an environment that fostered this interest in um, clin to be a clinician or was it technology and innovation? So originally it was all about clinician, but the things that really attracted me were the innovation articles. And that's what uh, that first article is about that captured my attention. And then the other huge factor uh, was my older brother, just this brilliant, brilliant kid who had a, uh, a lab in the garage where he'd make high explosives in his own rocket engines and made a laser in high school. I mean, he was that guy, and I saw how much satisfaction he got out of it, so I became a maker all through high school. My, my, the things I made weren't quite as, as advanced as the things he, uh, he was doing, but uh, I really learned the satisfaction of coming up with an idea, throwing something together to demonstrate the principle, and so that's been a dominant theme in my life as well. So I was lucky enough to actually hear you speak last year at Medical Alley Innovation Summit. In Minneapolis. In Minneapolis. Yeah, sure. Will you um, share with our audience how you got the inspiration from, as I think you, you call it, not just thinking about new ideas, but doing? So the first story yeah. has to do with the emergence of beating heart bypass in the United States. Beating heart bypass, what does that mean? Well, there's an operation called coronary artery bypass it's the most common heart operation done in the United States and elsewhere. And it's for treating blocked arteries on the surface of the heart. Uh, and because those arteries are so small and so delicate, the heart has to be motionless because if there's bleeding or motion, you're not gonna be able to put these 12 to 15 delicate little stitches in a cut that's this long in a tube as big around as spaghetti. You can imagine we wear big magnified telescopes and dexterous fingers and really fine titanium instruments. So historically, it had always been done with the heart stopped. And as you can imagine, to stop the heart, you have to do a lot of other things to keep the patient alive. So we put the patient on a machine that circulates blood through the body, that adds oxygen, takes out carbon dioxide, so that we can stop the heart and pack it nice and do the operation. And heart surgery had evolved that way over decades and became very safe and, and reproducible. But it turned out that some of the risk of a heart operation is putting the tubes and hoses in and stopping the heart and hooking you to the machine. So some guys in South America said, I wonder if we could do it with the heart still beating and not use the machine at all. One of my senior partners said, Billy, you ought to look at this. This might be big. Decreasing the invasiveness of bypass surgery. If 
going on the heart lung machine and stopping the heart was part of the invasiveness. Getting rid of that might be really cool. So I went and watched this guy do it. And he was a, a brilliant heart surgeon named Jim Fonger. And he had another heart surgeon from Johns Hopkins that had come over to help him. He was in one of the Johns Hopkins affiliated hospitals. And uh, Dr. Fonger made a cut and there was a little artery lurching around. And we're thinking, how is he gonna sew on that? Well, he took a, a little two prong fork, if you will. It had a handle, it had two prongs, that had rubber tubings over them so they wouldn't cut into the heart. And he put them on either side of the artery he was gonna move, he was gonna operate on and had his assistant mash down just enough to hold it still, so it was still enough that he could work on it. And he put little clamps on the artery, actually put rubber bands around him and pinched it off and opened it up and sewed the two things together. So there was still some movement, but nowhere near as much because his assistant was mashing down, but it looked really hard. His assistant, if he mashed too hard, the heart couldn't fill between heartbeats. The blood pressure would go down. The anesthesiologist would say, let up, let up, you're killing him, you're killing him. And so the, the doctor, Duke Cameron, would let up a little bit. If he didn't mash hard enough, though, the heart would slip out. The operation stopped. Dr. Fonga would reposition the stabilizer. Duke Cameron would, be, would redouble his concentration and hold it in place. And Dr. Fonga would start sewing again. And so what usually takes us 10 minutes to put those little stitches in, took 30 or 40 minutes. We were all holding our collective breath. But at the end of it, the patient got a great operation. And I finally got up my courage and I said, Dr. Fonga, congratulations. That was a... That was a great operation you did there. Um, it looks like your assistant has almost as hard of a job as you, mashing down, holding the artery still. Why don't they make it so the thing kind of attaches to the heart and then attaches to the retractor or to the patient or something so no one needs to hold it. You could set it and tighten it down and that way your assistant could help you sew instead of working on that. And he said, yeah, I'm sure somebody's developing that. And I said, yeah, me. And so I w went home that night on the plane, sketched out what I thought it should look like. Uh, it sort of seemed to me that it'd be kind of like a flattened spoon with a bent handle. And so I went and actually got spoons and flattened them and bent the handles and cut them up and made different shapes on them. And, and sometimes it didn't work very well, but other times it kind of did. And each time I'd go home have my idea about what I needed to change, go buy some more soup spoons, mash them out. It got working really well, and industry got involved, and they bought it and brought it to market. It became the Genzyme off-pump stabilizer, which is in several hundred thousand operations. And it was so exciting for me to see this thing that started off as a lowly flattened spoon after observing one case and seeing that looks challenging to a product that was you know, demonstrated at live meetings and had full page ads in all the magazines and was helping patients. Uh, that was that really ignited in me uh, something that's been dominant in my career. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that sure. story with me. Um, that story actually inspired me to create the Meet the Innovators web series. Is that right? Um, it absolutely oh, did. Oh, very cool. Uh, so, <laughs> For me... Well, let me put that on my CV as well. There you go, you know, inspiring yeah. MedTech Millennials left and right. <laughs> well, I think that's that's all of our highest calling is to inspire others because there's a non-finite amount of work to do. And if you create two innovators, you get credit for the stuff you come up with and partial credit for the stuff they come up with. Awesome. Exponential. So think, <laughs> yeah, no, inspiring people. I mean, that's, that's a, a big mission. I, I have five kids and I spend a lot of bandwidth trying to get them pumped up about what they're interested in or, you know, inspiring is, a, is our, should all be, should be all of our uh, priority. I couldn't agree more. And if I recall, that's one of your main points for device innovation, that you have to be a cheerleader. And oh, absolutely. That is a absolutely. huge component. So I'm chomping at the bit. You alluded to telling another story about oh, a yeah. patent, your second patent? Uh, uh, second patent in my life. So several before the spoon. Several before the spoon, yeah. but this is the... Spoon. When I was in training, you have to become a, a, a fully licensed general surgeon back then to even start training as a heart surgeon. But I was a general surgery resident, so I was taking out colon cancers and gallbladders and stuff like that. I was really eager to start sewing on blood vessels, so there's one operation that general surgeons do that involves that, and it's creating dialysis access. Do you know what dialysis is? You know, if a patient's in kidney failure, you have to hook them to a dialysis machine. The nurse working at the dialysis center 
has to find a place where he or she can put two needles into a big blood vessel. There is no blood vessel big enough or a torrential enough flow close enough to the surface, so we make one. We actually make an incision right here. We dissect out this big vein on the back of your wrist, swing it over and sew it to the artery. Then instead of having 60 or 70 cc's a minute flowing through it, it's now a short circuit. And I thought, this is as close to heart surgery as I'm gonna get. I love that operation. So it was really sort of disconcerting for me to realize that about half of those that I sewed closed off and didn't stay open. And I thought, what did I do wrong? And then I realized, no, that's par for the course. Well, it was in that sort of phase of my training that I encountered a young man who'd been stabbed in the arm in an altercation over a parking space, actually. And he came into the ER, and the ER chief called me to come look at him, and I said, can you wiggle your fingers? He could. He had pulses, he could feel. I said, give him a tetanus shot and antibiotics, send him home. And they sent him home with the admonition that he should avoid knife fights, if possible, and that he should return if he noticed anything weird. Well, two or three months later, he comes back and said, look at this, and all the veins in his arm were huge. The knife had gone right through an artery and right through a vein, and even though he'd injured the artery, he wasn't bleeding from the knife wound because it was following the low resistance pathway into the vein and going back to his heart, and we didn't appreciate it at the time. But now that his veins were huge, we said, oh, cool. We looked it up in a big textbook. It's called a traumatic arterial venous fistula. The ones we sew on purpose are arterial venous fistulas. This is one occurring after trauma. And as surgeons in training frequently do, we got the big book of trauma surgery and looked up arterial venous fistula and it says, you have to take these patients to the operating room, dissect out the whole thing, clamp the arteries and veins, find the hole in the artery and sew it up, find the hole in the vein and sew it up. They will never close on their own. And if you don't do a good job of fixing them, they'll recur. I said, got it never close on their own, recurve. Wait a second, the ones I make on purpose with my magnified vision, my dexterous fingers and titanium instruments close off half the time. And this guy with a pocket knife can make one that never closes off? That didn't seem fair. That guy probably didn't even go to medical school. I thought, I'll line up all my patients, I'll get that guy. No, so I thought there's something about a, a traumatic injury that's different than what we're doing where we dissect everything out. So I thought, well, I'm gonna make a system that does that. It's gonna be two catheters, one that goes in an artery and one that goes in a vein, and they're gonna have magnets on them, and they're gonna pull the two together, and we're gonna make a hole with a blade or electricity or something, and then it should be just like a traumatic one. It should stay open forever. So I went and talked to the tech transfer guys, and they said, oh, that's interesting, we'll get a patent attorney. The patent attorney looked high and low, uh, couldn't find anything similar. And so he said, yeah, it's probably patentable. So we filed the patent. And then I said, okay, let's make them and see if they work. And the tech transfer guy said, well, we don't actually make things. I looked around and found a place outside of Boston that did med tech uh, prototyping. And I drove out there in my Suzu Rodeo and I, I was pre-laptop, so I had a bunch of pictures that I'd drawn about how this should work. And I went in and described it to him and said, a catheter in the artery, a catheter in the vein, magnets pull them together, and then we'll make a hole either with uh, cutting electricity, radio frequency current that cuts through stuff, or a blade or something, and they should get an AV fistula. And the guys kind of looked at it and said, well, what holds the blood vessels together? What actually seals these cuts? And I said, well, nothing, but sometimes patients get stabbed or shot, and they get them, it'd be just like that. And they said, ugh. Maybe, I mean, sometimes they get that and you think, and I said, well, I mean, uh, it's worth trying. They said, well, okay, um, we can make you 10 prototypes of this device for $120,000. And I went, oh, well, I, I don't have any money. They said, well, I guess we're through here. And I said, well, can't you risk share? And they said, no, we don't do that. So tail between my legs, went back to the hospital, said, wow, this innovation stuff's a lot harder than I thought and went back to practicing heart surgery full time, you know, which is what I've been doing the whole time anyway. So nothing happened until 18 months later when the patent published. And a guy from Silicon Valley, who I now know is a brilliant, brilliant innovator, Josh Mackauer. I won't mention his name, um, who was uh, at the same Wilson Of course I know Josh. Yeah. And so Josh came out 
and called the hospital and said he wanted to buy the patent. And the hospital's like, yeah, fish on. And I said, I didn't know who Josh was at the time. Uh, you know, I didn't know anybody. And I said, well, wait, wait, if some guy from the West Coast wants to come and buy this, doesn't that mean it's valuable? Shouldn't we like try to develop it, doesn't it? And they said, kid, we got this. So Josh came in, he was starting a company called Transvascular that hooked arteries and veins together. He thought this would be a good patent in the portfolio, another way to possibly do it, you know, a barrier to entry for anybody else who wanted to try to do it. The hospital sold him the patent for this much money and some options in transvascular. He then went on and raised this much money and did some brilliant, brilliant work. And if you were a pig and had coronary artery disease, it worked great. They had challenges when they moved into clinicals and ultimately the company sold for substantially less money than it raised to a large Minneapolis-based med tech company that starts with the letter M. Hmm. <laughs> where it sat collecting dust for the next number of years. And I thought, where's that AV fistula patent? So then I met Adam Berman, and Adam and I spent a year and a half, finally got the IP back and started a company. Now I had an animal lab. Now I knew how to make stuff. I made a pair of the catheters, stuck them in an animal, made a fistula, it worked just like I thought. We went and raised money from Sante, got some more from S3, got some more from TriStar, got from four of the biggest strategics invested in the company, went down to Paraguay, did a bunch of Paraguayans, it worked well, did a study in Canada and Australia, got CE Mark, went commercial a couple years ago, got through the FDA on June 22nd, and on July 9th sold the company for more money than I ever thought I would see in my whole life. And mic drop. Yeah, mic drop. <laughs> What would you say then this experience, your lesson learned or your takeaway from going back and trying to get that IP back and then having success at the end, what was the takeaway? So there were several takeaways. One is perseverance is as important as anything else. And to persevere takes a lot of energy and takes a commitment to get over the, the, the dark times when things aren't working. And that's all about team. Surround yourself with brilliant people that are resilient and, uh, and perseverant and develop a culture of, we are gonna do this. I don't know how, but we will succeed. And every time we hit a wall, we'll either go to the left or the right or under it or over it, but we're gonna keep going until we land this because you look at you know, the technical uh, achievements that have occurred in the last 100 years or 1,000 years or 10,000, whatever, I mean, those are by people working hard and overcoming challenges. So if you come up with a project, know that you probably don't have it fleshed out correctly. You may not even be aiming for the right uh, objective, but you surround yourself with brilliant, passionate people and just keep at it and you can create uh, important stuff that helps patients. Beautiful words. You have been an inspiration to me personally, as I shared with you, an inspiration to everybody in this room and at the Center for Device Innovation at Texas Medical Center. I wish you the very best. Thanks. I have one favor for you before we close out today. Yeah. Will you show me your lab? Yeah. Come on, man. Fantastic. We're super proud of it. <laughs>